Well, good morning. I, uh, I'm an Aggie, so howdy. All right. Uh, it really is an honor to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, I, I came in here with my eight kids, so I doubled your attendance. Uh, this morning just by being here. Uh, we, we do have a large family, uh, eight children, my husband and I, uh, we do know how it happens. So that's what I always tell people. People will always ask, don't you know how that happens? Yes, we do. And we like it. So <laughs> I can say that in church, right? Um, Anyway, it is really good to be here with you. I, uh, I, as Pastor Russ said, I did work in an abortion clinic for eight years of my life. And uh, people always ask me, you know, how does that happen, Abby? I was raised in a, a good Christian home. Um, you know, I, I was, a lot of people think, you know, oh, if, you're, if you work in an abortion clinic, if you, if you work in something like that, then, you know, that must mean that you were raised in a home where you didn't hear about God or you, you know, you weren't raised in a Christian home, and that, that wasn't true. I was raised in a Christian home. I've got amazing parents. Um, I was baptized when I was eight. I grew up knowing the Lord, loving him, serving him. I remember growing up and <clears throat> hearing my parents say that we were pro-life. I remember hearing that um, we were against abortion, but um, if you would have put me in a debate against someone who was for abortion, if you would have put me in a debate against someone who was pro-choice, I probably would have lost because we didn't sit around the dinner table and talk about abortion. We didn't talk about what it was. We didn't talk about the ins and outs of what that meant. Um, I just sort of said whatever my parents said, right? So if they were pro-life, I was pro-life. That's, that's about as far as it went. Um, we didn't, you know, we said we were pro-life, but we didn't actually live as pro-life people. And when I went to college, I, I met a woman who was with Planned Parenthood. And if you don't know, Planned Parenthood is our country's largest abortion provider. Every year um, in our country, there are just over one million abortions performed in the United States about 3,000 abortions committed every single day in the United States, every single day. Abortion is legal in the United States through all 40 weeks of pregnancy for any reason. In the state of Texas, a woman can have an abortion through the first five months of pregnancy for any reason. And in 12 states, it is legal for a woman to have an abortion electively for any reason through all nine months of pregnancy. And in five states, there are doctors that will do it. I met a woman who was with Planned Parenthood in college. She asked me what I knew about the organization. I really knew nothing. Um, she told me that they were an organization that was there to help women. And who doesn't want to help women, right? That sounded good. She told me that, uh, that their goal was to keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. And that sounded good too, right? Let's keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. And that was certainly the talking points that I heard from everyone in the media. And so I got involved, not really knowing much about the organization. And um, I stayed there for eight years, believing that I was doing the right thing, believing that I was helping women, believing that I was really reducing the abortion numbers. It wasn't until my last couple years inside of the abortion industry that I started to see what was really taking place inside of the organization. And at the time, I didn't know if it was that the organization was changing or if I was really just starting to see what we had been about all along. And I realize now I was just starting to see what we had been about all along. It was just that God was starting to open my eyes little by little to what was really taking place all around me. In January of 2009, I was inside of a management meeting, and we were told that we were going to be building the largest abortion facility in the Western Hemisphere. It was going to be in Houston. What is in Houston? It's open now. Uh, it is 78,000 square feet. It is seven stories tall. 
the third floor was going to be operational so that we would be able to abort babies through the sixth month of pregnancy. And we were going to be able to uh, abort 75 babies every single day, six days a week. And I was going to have an office there on that third floor, on that late-term abortion floor. And I remember thinking, oh, this is sort of problematic for me because now we were going to be killing babies that were actually viable outside of the womb. And that was where my line was in the sand. I remember thinking, okay, abortion's okay as long as they're not viable outside of the womb. That was sort of my line in the sand. And here we were going to be aborting babies that were actually going to be viable outside of the womb. And so that was a problem for me. And I think that was really the first time that I was thinking to myself, maybe this is where, maybe I can't work here for the rest of my life. And that was, I think, where God was starting to chip away at that callus that had formed around my heart. A few months later, we had another meeting and I was told during that management meeting that we were going to be doubling our abortion quota, the number of abortions that we had to sell to women coming into our facility. And that didn't make sense to me because here I thought that we were supposed to be keeping abortion rare. But now I'm being told that we had to double our abortion quota. And that didn't make sense. So I said something in my management meeting and I said, wait a minute. I thought we we're supposed to keep abortion rare, and my boss looked at me and said, Abby, why would we want to keep abortion rare? That's how we make our money. And I remember walking out of that meeting feeling confused and not really knowing what was going on. But then about a month later, I had an encounter where I was called in to assist during an ultrasound-guided abortion procedure. And I, my job was to hold the ultrasound probe on the woman's abdomen during the abortion procedure so the doctor would be able to see the baby during the abortion. And the baby was 13 weeks along, and at 13 weeks, everything on an unborn child is completely formed. Arms, legs, fingers, toes, every internal organ is completely formed on that unborn child. And I remember looking at the screen and seeing this baby on the ultrasound monitor. And I watched in horror as this child began to fight and struggle for his life against the abortion instruments during the procedure. And I knew then that inside the womb, there was a living human being. That there was humanity, that there was life inside of the womb. And I knew that if those things were true, then I knew that I was on the wrong side of this debate and I had to leave. And so I did. And when I left, I reached out to people who had been standing outside of my facility for the entire eight years that I had been working at Planned Parenthood. And that's really why I'm here to talk to you today. These people who had stood outside of my facility, who had reached out to me day in and day out, even sometimes when I had been really mean to them, sometimes I had yelled at them, sometimes I had said really ugly things to them, they had always continued to show up, to be there. And I'm reminded of the story in the Bible of the Good Samaritan. And I was thinking about that story this morning, and then the first song that you guys sang during worship was talking about showing kindness to people. And that also reminded me of the story of the Good Samaritan. I worked in this big abortion facility, and every day people would drive by that clinic knowing what took place there, knowing that every day their brothers and sisters were being killed inside of that facility. And most of them would drive by every single day and they wouldn't stop to help. They wouldn't stop to pray for those lives, to pray for the mothers going in. They would just continue to drive by. But there were a few who would stop. 
and they would pray, and they would reach out, and on occasion, they would save a life. They were the good Samaritans who would stop. And on the day that I decided to walk away from that facility, I went to them, to those good Samaritans who had been there, who had stopped every day, who had prayed for me. And I went to them, and I I left the clinic, and I've been out now for over 10 years. But that prompted me some time ago after I'd been out of the abortion clinic, that prompted me to sort of rethink how we think about others who may need our help. Because I would say that if I ask all of you, who in here considers themselves pro-life, probably all of you would raise your hand. But what does that actually mean for us when we say we're pro-life? Because being pro-life isn't just us sitting in here in a church and raising our hands and saying that we're pro-life. Because every day, 2,400 babies, 2,400 to 3,000 babies are dying every single day in our country. And us sitting here and raising our hands and saying we're pro-life is doing nothing about it. And every day, there's people sitting in nursing homes who are dying, who are feeling hopeless, who feel like they have no one surrounding them with love. And they're part of the pro-life movement too. Because when we're pro-life, we say that we're we're pro-life from conception until natural death. And that means all life in between, right? And so there's people that run the gamut from conception until natural death who are living life, who are feeling hopeless, who are in need of help, who are in need of assistance, who are in need of Christ. And it's our responsibility to be Christ to them, to show love to them. And so that's why I started a ministry called Pro Love Ministries. And so I, today, I'm not asking for your financial support at all. Any financial giving you have, I want you to give it to your church, and I want you to give it to the Gideons. That's money, that's where I want you to give. What I'm asking you to do today for Pro Love Ministries, I want you to think about how you can give your time. Because you live in a rural community but there are people here who need your time. And this is an opportunity for you to be the church to people in your community who need the love of Christ desperately from conception until natural death. There are people here in your community who need you. So, I started Pro Love Ministries a while back, and um, our goal is to fill in the gaps in the pro life community. People who um, need help, who need the love of Christ. And, um, and so when I was talking, Kathy was talking about how there are, um, there are, you guys are resource needy in your community for uh, places for people to go. And you guys are in need of um, people to help fill those resources. And a lot of times in rural communities, you may not have um, all of the resources available. So that means that you have to be the resource. So I live, in, I live in the Austin area. So it's easy for me if a woman comes to me and says, uh, well, I need this resource. I need a food pantry. I need this. I need that. I need a shelter. I need whatever. It's easy for me to go to 211 or to Google you know, resources in the Austin area, and I can find it, and I can plug that woman in. But that's not the case here. You don't have all those resources available. So therefore, you have to be the resource. You have to be that good Samaritan yourself. 
And so what we're hoping to create in this area is basically a resource pool among you guys and with other churches. So you can think of resources that you may have yourself that you could help a, a woman or someone who, uh, an elderly person or whoever may need a resource that you can help be that resource for that person. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Okay. So that's what we're hoping that you guys um, can provide here in this community. So what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to start here with this church and we're wanting to reach out to other churches in the area so that we can create a larger base. So um, we've had situations where women have needed to um, flee from uh, a domestic violence situation, okay? And so they may need housing. And so, okay, we're gonna find them housing, but they need furniture, right? For the, for the housing situation they're in. Okay, awesome. So we can send out an email and say, we need housing. Who has an extra couch? Who has an extra chair? Who has an extra bed? Um, because you don't have a Goodwill here that we can go to, right? So it's gotta be you. You're the Goodwill, <laughs> okay? Um, or we have uh, a woman who, um, let's say that same woman who usually stays at home with her children, she needs to go to a doctor's appointment and she needs someone to watch her kids while she's at the doctor's appointment. Well, you don't have, to, you don't have a daycare here. So we need someone to come and watch her kids in her house for two hours while she goes to the doctor. Well, we don't have a drop-in daycare. So you've got to be the drop-in daycare. So we need to send out an email. Who can come watch Jane's kids for two hours? Does this make sense? Okay. Or, okay, now Jane has a, um, she's, got a she's got something wrong with her radiator. Jane needs help with her car. Certainly, somebody in here or somebody at another church is a mechanic or knows how to work on cars. Does somebody in here know how to work on cars? or knows somebody that knows how to work on cars? Sure, right, somebody does. So we're gonna put out an email and we're gonna say, hey, Jane needs somebody to work on cars, can you help us? And that somebody's gonna come and help Jane. This is what we're trying to build in this community because guys, this is what it is to be the Good Samaritan. This is what it is to be the church. We are not, God does not want us to be a society that relies on the government for our every need. God wants us to rely on each other. God wants us to build up the church. God wants us to rely on each other. God wants us to be the good Samaritans for each other, not to just pass by each other on the road and say, well, We'll let somebody else fix that. We are to be Christ to one another. We are to fulfill those needs for one another. And guess what? When Jane sees God in each one of us, Jane wants to know more about God. It's not just about fixing her car, guys. This is about bringing Jane the knowledge of salvation. This is about equipping Jane with the knowledge of eternal life. It's about bringing Jane into this community so that she has the community for the rest of her earthly life so that she can go on to have eternal life. That's what a church is about. A church isn't about coming into this building and singing awesome songs and hearing a pastor preach. We've got to be the church to one another, and we have to be the church when we go outside of these walls. That's what church is all about. So that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to build up inside of these, in this rural community. So that's where you come in. 
So we have a, and you may think, I don't really have any skills to offer. Well, I promise that you do. God will equip you for what he needs from you. So don't worry about that. You may think, I don't have anything. You do. You have something that these women will need, or men. It's not just women. Uh, Pro-Love Ministries, we've been able to help a lot of men. This is, people are in crisis. Many people are in crisis right now. And God will give you the skills that they need. So, um, so, very quickly, Pastor Russ, I think, created a sign-up sheet. So, what we want you to do, if you're interested in being a part of this, and you know what, and your part in this may be to be a prayer warrior for what's happening in here. Everybody should be putting their name on this list. I'm just going to be honest. Because every one of you has a part to play in this, whether it's to be a prayer warrior or whether it's to be like a direct outreach person. But what we're going to do is we're going to put this sign-up sheet outside on the table. And if you would sign up here, you can put your name, email, phone number, whatever. Um, and then Kathy will get in touch with you. And what I would like to see happen is that we create a group here at this church and, um, you know, spend some time in prayer about it, how God wants to lead you into this ministry. And, um, and then I'll come back, and then we can, with other churches, we can create something really awesome in this community so that, you know, no person goes hungry, no person goes without somewhere to eat somewhere to stay, you know, no person goes without shelter, no person goes without clothing. I'll sort of finish with this, with this really neat story. There was a um, very rural town outside of Tyler, and I can't remember the name, it's called like Possum Trail, I think, Possum something, I think it's Possum Trail. So. Uh, it's a really small community, and it's, uh, it's all African Americans. It's an African American community out uh, a very rural place out past Tyler. And um, this community wanted to, uh, they have a, a Baptist church there. And this community wanted to get involved in the pro life fight, but they didn't know what to do. There was uh, no abortion clinic anywhere around them. And so they, didn't, you know, they were like, well, we, we would go pray outside of an abortion clinic, but there's no abortion clinic near us, so we really don't know what to do. So they met for a prayer meeting, and they decided as a church that they were going to call the, uh, the county, and they were going to call the Child Protective Services organization, and they were going to find out uh, what it would take to foster one of the children in CPS custody. So they thought, okay, we're going to foster um, a child, and we're going to have a family within the church. They're going to go through the training. They're going to foster a child. And then as a church, we're going to help that family, right? So we're going to we're going to pitch in, and, and it's going to be like the church fostering this child, right? And that's how we're going to serve you know, as a, as a pro-life community, right? We're going to foster a child. Okay, so the pastor calls, and the, the group says, well, there's 72 children in foster care right now. So the pastor says, whoa, okay, that's a lot more than we thought. We thought there might be like 10, okay? So he goes back to the church. They have their next meeting, and he says, church, there's more than we thought. There's 72 so maybe there's like two families that could take this on, you know? So he says, I'm going to, we're going to bow our heads, and everybody's going to pray. We're going to take this time to pray. And if you feel called, if you feel led to take on, a, take on a child in the foster care system, I just want you to raise your hand. And there's no shame. If you don't feel like this is something you could do, don't worry about it. But if you do, just raise your hand. So they all bowed their heads, and they were all praying. And people started raising their hands. 
but they were raising their hands and they were holding up numbers of how many children they were willing to take. And when the pastor started counting up the fingers, it was exactly 72 that were being held up. And that church took in all 72 foster care children. And that church, that church community, they single-handedly take in every single foster child that comes through that county. And these children are making a difference. They're not on drugs. They're not on the street. They are raising up godly men and women for Christ because that church decided to stop. They decided to be the Good Samaritan. They didn't just walk by. They decided to be the church, to make a difference in the lives of these children, in the lives of these people that they knew they could serve. And so that's what I'm asking you guys to do today, to stop and to serve and to be that Good Samaritan. Thank you all so much.